So Barry, in a nutshell, what is your research about? Yeah, so my research was um, looking to see if there were if there were patterns or there were roles that particular genders tended to take on in particular activities within a group work setting in the sciences in particular and both formal and informal settings within within the sciences space so formally um, group work tends to take place in the labs so students would conduct group work uh, kind of a particular experiment for example and then following on from that then there might be some sort of write-up associated with that as well so within those formalized settings you know in the lab and also then in the report writing element did particular genders take on particular tasks regularly and consistently within within that and then also in in informal spaces as well through chatting with students did they notice themselves when they were just working in groups studying in groups for example informally did particular genders take on particular tasks within those spaces as well the idea behind this i suppose is if we can identify the patterns we can maybe try to understand those patterns and then if we can understand those patterns we might be able to take a look at trying to develop a set of considerations for people just to think about you know from a staff perspective but also from a student perspective about how they might make the learning space whether they're formal or informal, a little bit more equitable, a little bit more balanced, a little bit more fair for all the genders and none, so that everyone gets a fair chance to learn uh, in a space and a place that they feel uh, they can do best in. Mm. Well, that's interesting. I mean, that there are many interesting and pressing issues and problems in science education. So what prompted you to choose this topic for your fellowship research? Yeah, for me, it was kind of threefold, I suppose. Firstly, I've been teaching labs for quite a long time now over a decade now in different institutions in Ireland uh, at different levels on different programs so kind of a wide range of experiences and I suppose going back a little bit further in time I was one of those students once I sat at lab benches in a group doing group work as part of my undergraduate qualification I sat in very frustrating group write-up sessions after a lab pulling my hair when I had hair out um, and uh, I maybe developed a worldview around my personal experience so from looking from the, the, the top bench looking down at the students as an academic and also from sitting at the, at the lab benches looking up at the academic I kind of experienced both of those and then more recently I suppose for me as I continue my professional development throughout my career I've gotten involved in things such as Athena Swan within our university and that's really opened my eyes to to appreciate other people's perspectives. So we're looking at the same thing, but we might be experiencing it totally differently based on you know, my gender or my worldview or my, my skin color. And um, so it really got me thinking about, you know, I need to think about things a lot differently. It's not just what I see through my own eyes, my own lenses that I put in front of my eyes. I need to think about, you know, what do other people experience and how do they experience it? And how does that affect their learning? And um, so three, threefold, I suppose, my own, you know, when I was a student, when I was an academic and then the things that I'm doing now at the moment out around the university have really got me thinking about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and maybe I could do it a little bit better and maybe it's just, a, just not me so maybe I can help others if I can do a little bit of research and find the evidence maybe then we can start a conversation and raise awareness. That's great motivation and I always find it fascinating that um, our research tends to be prompted by our own personal experiences but why does this topic matter to other people who learn and teach and lead across the higher education community? Yeah like I, I am one of those people in that community we all are I suppose anyone who's listened to this podcast probably has an interest in, in in the community and for me it's two perennially challenging topics group work and then gender and put them together and you got a real you know perfect storm Um, so there's there, there's lots of things in there to try and unpick lots of things in there to try and understand and um, and even if all I achieve out of this is a little bit more of an awareness amongst more staff and more students about the possibilities, even the considerations, if they don't get enacted in every classroom, in every lab, every week, it doesn't really matter. It just means that people have started thinking about these things and started talking about these things that's not been swept under the carpet anymore. And you know, really the considerations are all about de developing an equitable environment for the most productive learning for staff and for students. So it's a win-win for everybody if we can get it right. So for the learners, you know, th this this group work activity that we, we ask students to take part in regularly is quite divisive you know students either love it or hate it. it's marmite you know some students really get on in groups they really love it they really enjoy the social side of it and some students just hate it they can't deal with the 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 need to work with other people you know they're they're, they're lone wolves almost and they perform better as 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 a lone wolf so within this project it was it was definitely co-created with, with students as partners all the way through from initial idea all the way through to project execution and the considerations that are coming out of it are all molded by the students that were involved various different students of different types got involved in this so it's 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 a student voice loud and proud is where it's coming from for the teachers then it's 
practice. You know, this will hopefully inform and shape what a staff member will do in a classroom environment, in a lab environment. And it's not just in sciences. You know, you could think of, think of an engineering design lab. You can think of an architecture studio. You could see how this practical side of, of learning can be transformed if you consider a few very simple considerations and just think about them and say, have I done this as good as I could do? And just know what to think about. And from the leader's perspective, you know, it's all about the, the agency of the student and the authenticity of the research that it is grounded in the student voice. So it's a way to connect the leaders to the learners. So sometimes there's a bit of a divorce between those at the top of the totem pole and those at the bottom of the totem pole. So hopefully this is a connector that will allow that voice to raise up and be heard to those up up at the top. And, and really, if we, if, we, if we listen at all across all those levels, there's something in it for everybody and everybody should benefit from all of it. Mm. I love the way you talk about involving students. And not only are you listening to the student voice, but you're getting them involved in designing the research as well, which I think is a really good thing to do. Now, wow, gender and group work are both really hot topics in higher education research, so much so that I know there's been previous research in both those areas. So what do we already know about this topic from previous literature? We know an awful lot and we know very little all at the same time, if that makes sense. There's been a lot of research, you know, in the last decades in particular, um, focusing around you know, gender representation, trying to balance the gender representation, but also maximizing the benefit of having a mixed gender society, um, you know, in terms of innovation, creativity, productivity, particularly in complex science systems. It's it's a really of a benefit to have a mixed gender set up there. Now, there, there's still issues uh, and, you know, they can be kind of categorized, I suppose, into access, you know, the pedagogy, the nature and culture of science, as well as identity. You know, and these are all seen as, as still barriers, despite lots of research being carried out, lots of policy being put in place, lots of awareness raising being put in place. And um, we still haven't quite turned the corner, I don't think, but at least the conversations are happening more regularly and more fluidly now than they were in the past. From a pedagogical perspective, um, lots of research has been done on this. Um, and, and really, if you were to sum it up in, in a nutshell, it would be if you create an inclusive learning environment, it benefits everybody. So, you know, there's, there is no losers. It's a rising tide. All the boats will rise up. So an inclusive learning environment is a, is a good is a good thing to have. Um, and with that, then you can develop a sense of identity, you know, for, for scientists in particular, this is quite important and a sense of belonging within the scientific community. So uh, in Ireland, we have you can't see if you can't see it, you can't be it as a phrase for, you know, trying to encourage girls to get into sport. So if you can't see a female black scientist in you know common culture or, you know, in a textbook, how is that going to motivate you as a young black scientist to see what you could be? So it's about raising awareness and it's about developing a sense of identity. Um, from the group work perspective, group work has been researched for as long as group work has been in existence, I think. And uh, you can look back through the literature and there's just, there's there's eons of, of, of information there in, in the peer reviewed databases. And, you know, it's, it's a really good thing for active learning. It's you know great for collaboration, great for communication development, you know, just the softer skills of social identity development and developing your belonging and discipline. So, again, it feeds back into this idea of belonging and identity. Um, but with group work, there's a massive risk of marginalization of those within the group. Um, and that marginalization can be broken down on, on you know, many different factors, gender, socioeconomic background. So the intersectionality is really important here, I suppose. Um, and trying to unpick that intersectionality is, 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 is quite tricky. Um, and then I suppose with group work, you know, group work for learning is, is, is kind of understandable very easily. You know, you get together, you discuss and you chat and you figure things out. Group work for assessment is really where the, the rubber hits the road, as the saying goes. Um, and, you know, around that is assessment. How do you fairly assess within a group when you have three or four or five students working together? How do you fairly assess those three or four or five students on all aspects of the group work? So the process as well as the product, you know, social skill development, if you are looking at that as an important learning outcome. So really, for me, what came out of, of, of reviewing the literature is this idea of a need to support both staff and students in this particular aspects so of group work and group work if, with mixed genders. If you have a mixed gender class environment, how can you support both the staff and the students to maximize their, their teaching or their learning, depending on, on, on what they are? So really, if you can figure out a way to optimize that, it benefits everybody, both the staff and the students. So the literature is there. There's loads of evidence there. Um, and really what I'm trying to do in this case is to put an Irish higher education perspective on that international um, awareness that we have in the literature. Um, so it, it, we know lots, but we don't know everything is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, everything you said just demonstrates what a challenging area this is to research. So how did you go about your research? 
Yeah, so I took a mixed method um, approach, and and the mixed method approach is where you kind of combine number data with word data, um, so qualitative and quantitative. So the number data came from an, an online survey that was um, posted through social media, through social networks that I have within the universities in Ireland, um, and targeted primarily science students. But when word got out, um, other students said, "Well, could we take part as well?" Um, so I, I now had two research populations, the non, as I categorize them, the non-science students and then the science students. And the science students were the broad disciplines within the sciences and um, the, the physical and life sciences. And um, so the survey was 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 the primary quantitative data collection method. And then qualitative data collection was collected through um, semi-structured interviews. So I interviewed five purposely sampled um, students um, and the gender breakdown was one, he, him, six, she, her. And then we had a design thinking workshop where again we brought the students back in, a different cohort of students back in again. And we had staff in the in the design workshop as well. And we kind of probed and asked questions around the tricky areas that emerged from the quantitative data and the qualitative data before that were issues lay around how to best carry out group work in a mixed gender setting and then ask the, the participants in the design thinking workshop, well, how might we do this better? So how might we deal with conflict better? How might we raise awareness of the benefit of having a mixed gender group? So the design thinking workshop was the kind of the, the point of the pyramid where all the data underneath was informing what was discussed at the design thinking workshop. And um, yeah, it, it, it allowed for frank conversations around very pointed things as opposed to just a generalized chat. We went in and we had an hour, we had four things to talk about. And we got both a staff perspective and a student perspective and I kind of stood back and let them bounce off each other and out of that then the considerations came, you know, what what practical things can we do to help in those fee four four key areas, you know, around conflict and um, gender representation in the curriculum um, how to deal with um, assessment as well as learning in the group and then how to um, you know, raise awareness of the benefit of having a mixed gender group so people will actively seek a mixed gender group because they know it's better to have a mixed gender group than not. So collectively, numbers and words kind of came together and then you know, the task I suppose was to de de decipher those words and numbers and make sense of them. And with the students all along the way, they helped me understand, you know, from their lived experience in the trenches, what's it like, as opposed to me with my rose tinted view of, of student life, you know, they were telling me really the raw version. And with that then, with that kind of authenticity and agency, it allowed me to kind of put um, a little bit of synthesis on, on their words to bring it together. And then we came up with those four considerations. Mm, that sounds like a really rich design. So what are the key initial findings from your research? Um, so the initial key findings um, were surprising for me for a start. Um, I kind of came in thinking, oh, we're going to have lots of debate, lots of discussion, lots of argument. But the, the trends kind of came out and were kind of kind of aligned, just independent of whether they were science or non-science students, first of all. So um, a big thumbs up for group learning. That was a, a big trend. Uh, students really enjoyed the group learning. A big thumbs down for group assessment. <laughs> so wow. uh, it was almost like two populations and the two populations spread, you know, one really positive, one really negative. That in, in terms of assessment, the assessment was seen as not as positive as the learning because of all these issues we discussed before, you know, the fairness of assessment, the laggard in the group, you know, how to deal with conflict. So all these things that are in the literature um, raised their heads again, I suppose, in, in this research. Um, from the quantitative point of view, most of the students that took part in the survey were honours degree. Most of them were in a university setting. The responses were across all the years um, and most of the students, you know, 98 percent of the students were full time students. So within that, there is a certain story to be told. And there's a certain story not being told. So we have you know, part time students, you know, students who come along, take a couple of modules, take a break, come back again. So we're not hearing their voice. So really the, the voice we're hearing here is of a particular type of student. Um, from the qualitative data, then the, the big things that came out then were, you know, clumping them together into kind of teams where the roles carried out, the skills carried out and um, the mixed gender group work itself and then the, the lack of gender patterns as opposed to gender patterns. So the, the key thing that came out of the, the interviews and then the design thinking workshop was gender doesn't seem to be as much as an issue for the students today as what I perceived it to be or what I experienced when I was uh, in, in undergraduate days. And we kind of explore that a little bit more. And there's um, there's a big emphasis being put on mixed gender schools at second level and primary level as a way of kind of breaking the mold that students don't see gender as a thing. 
the, the students have issues with other students in terms of group work, but it's not based on gender. It's based on skills or ability or commitment. So if a student is not pulling their weight, independent of gender, that student is not seen to be a very productive group member. So for me, um, you know, it, it was an interesting find in itself to realize that the students of Ireland today are really savvy around gender and really able to speak up for themselves. You know, we, I asked a few questions. Uh, if this happened, what would you do? And every single student responded, look, I'd speak up. I'd, I'd say, look, this isn't appropriate. So they're articulate, they're aware, um, and they're, they're very happy to work together in a mixed gender group. Only problem is when students don't pull their weight, and that is independent of gender. So for me, um, the big findings, and there's a little bit more of, of work to be done in terms of digging out uh, all the information out of the data I've collected so far, but that, that's a big thing that, you know, learning is good, assessment isn't so good, and then gender isn't the big issue that I initially thought it was. Mm, that's really interesting, en encouraging in many ways, but I think it uncovers some other interesting questions uh, as well. So you said that result surprised you. Was there anything else that surprised you in your research that you want to talk about? Yeah, the, the big surprise was that that lack of a pattern. Now, within within the kind of the self-reported self-efficacy in group work function, there was there was five areas that the genders, there was a statistically significant difference in the gender responses. Everything else you know, 20 odd questions were all pretty much didn't matter whether he, her, she or he, him, she, her, you were kind of given the same response. Um, so the, the ones that they did differentiate on were, you know, group work function, problem solving and analysis. Now, that's not to say he, him were better than she, her. It's just that there was a difference in their responses, you know, but leadership output in a group, they were all pretty much saying the same thing. Um, and there were certain trends, mega trends, I suppose, where all the genders said the same thing. And one of the biggest trends was ability to deal with conflict. They really struggled with conflict, how to resolve conflict. I, I think the big problem lies when we chat to them a little bit more in, in the discussion groups. They were kind of saying, I'm going to be working with these guys for the next four years or three years or two years. I don't want to be kind of rocking the boat in second year and then I'm working with this person again in, in fourth year. Um, but I don't know how to deal with doing that in an in an equitable, fair, transparent, I get my point across way and not annoy that other person. And that was the same for both genders. And it was really low in terms of self-efficacy. Like they were well, well below the average for all the genders. So there's a there's there's a, a need to help students develop those skills. You know, we, we can't just throw them in the groups, away you go, figure it out. We need to help them to, to solve those issues when they do arise, because they will arise. Um, and that was part of the design thinking workshop. How, do, how can we do that? Um, and you know some of the suggestions came back were around allowing the students to a space and a place to talk about the process issues as opposed to the group work issue you know the, the deliverable the the report whatever it is take that aside and get them to talk about what how are we going to do group work you know how, what was our our formula going to be are we going to have a contract of you know that we're going to do certain things we're going to meet on certain days so the process as well as the the kind of thing they're going to produce are differentiated and then they can discuss issues over here in in the kind of process chat that won't affect their ability to write up or get a good mark because the mark and the process seem to be intertwined and that's where tensions really come flare up because everyone wants a good mark but sometimes yeah. the tensions can kind of can, can, can fray a little bit there at the edges so separating those two out was a suggestion from the students themselves that, look if, if we could just have someone to help us understand what we should do because we're new to this you know you guys as academics probably know a bit better H help us to develop our process and then let us add the group work activity, but we need to figure out how to do it properly first. So um, yeah, the, the lack of a pattern and then when there was a pattern, it was a very obvious pattern. It was like a sore thumb sticking up. It was very obvious that students were crying out for help in certain areas. Mm, and that uh, conflict resolution obviously has big implications for life beyond university as well. That's 100%, um, yeah. Yeah, mm, it, really? it's, 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 it's more than just getting the, the report in on time and getting a good mark. It's, it's a bigger picture thing you're developing with the students. If you can get them, to maybe not be perfect at it, but at least when they go to the workplace, they've got some of those skills in their back pocket that they can pull out when they are met with a manager or you know another group situation where the dynamic isn't quite right and they don't feel comfortable. How can they speak up or how can they articulate? If they develop it in a safe space in university, when they go to you know, a work environment, they should be able to hopefully translate that over. Yeah, absolutely. So just to, to finish up with then, what do your initial findings mean then for higher education policy and practice? Yeah, there's there's several fold, I suppose, but not, not to labour on the point. I've, I've broken them kind of down into the, the National Forum Student Success Framework and picked out a kind of a one or two key headings to kind of just give a bit of context of, of what could be done. What's, what's an easy win, I suppose? What's a low hanging fruit? What can we do here? Um, 
And I suppose the first one is if under the enabling institutional capabilities uh, heading and evidence based decision making within this research, there is now clear evidence that students need support and assessment if it's part of a group work environment needs to be carefully considered within an integrated learning and assessment strategy. You can't just be stuck on at the end because you know you've run out of time or you've got too many things to correct. And you want to divide it by four by having groups of four. So we need to think about how to support staff in thinking strategically in terms of their assessment strategy for a semester for you know even across a program for example if a program team could come together and then the support for students how to deal with a group work environment that will be assessed how to you know maybe divorce the thing from the pro process and allow them to figure out their process first and then let them come in and, and do their thing um, and the same for the staff you know so support is, is a big thing big thing there and this leads into the, the second point is structured and well-resourced professional development and um, staff you know, are becoming more aware of gender in, in our lives, I suppose, through initiatives like Athena Swan and so on. And how best can we translate that awareness raising at that level into our teaching practice? So can we, you know, bring our Athena Swan hat with us and bring it into the lab with us and, and try and translate some of the stuff that we're discussing and we're, the initiatives we're trying to do at a university level into, you know, a classroom level or into a, a lab level. And the same for the students, you know, could those students be exposed to more Athena Swan like initiatives at a, at a student level as opposed to just been done at the university and they're part of the university, but they're not really part of the Athena, Athena Swan process. Um, and I suppose from um, a, an enabling practices perspective, under the assessment of feedback, it's, it's quite obvious, you know, the, the assessment was was not really liked in terms of group perspective, but maybe that's that's an opportunity. You know, if we look at you know, previous work from the National Forum the of Foreign as Learning Assessment Approaches with support would allow the students to see the reason behind doing a group based assessment. A lot of the time from the focus groups and the interviews, the students were kind of saying, I don't really get why we're doing this in a group. I could probably do it on my own. And that's probably poor design from the the assessment perspective and also poor communication. You know, here's the reason why you're doing this in assessment as a group as opposed to doing it on your own. Um, and again, focus on key things like conflict resolution, you know, coordinating resources within the group, you know, focusing on the output. And as you said before, this is definitely a set of transferable skills that are going to be great for when they're in university, but even more important when they get out of outside university in, in the big bad world. So, you know, agility, resilience, adaptability, all these things are important for the students to be able to call on when they need it. And where they develop that, but in a safe space, like in a university setting. Um, so, and, and beyond beyond that, I suppose, for from the from the sector perspective, I suppose, I really lent on a national community of practice, the Shore Network, to the Science Undergraduate Research Experience Network. I'm, I'm part of that network, and it allowed me to connect into other academics that were kind of friendly to this type of research, and then students within those institutions were. Um, or contactable in a much more efficient way than me just kind of shouting out from behind the screen and hoping that somebody would listen to me and um, it allowed them to put a face to a name and a reason to take part in, in the survey and it broadened the base of that targeted population those science students um, and it allowed me to get students from across the higher education sector in Ireland so communities of practice are, are really cool things to be involved in they're great soundboards for crazy ideas that you do have sometimes that someone needs to temp you down a little bit but give you enough encouragement to do it but kind of calm you down a little bit and um, so I really think if, if we could develop you know we have one in science the science undergraduate research experience is, is quite productive and quite um busy at the moment but there's certainly other areas in in higher education that don't have that community that national community to draw people together to be soundboards for each other to be supports for each other and um, so if we are really going to do cross cross island you know north and south of ireland research we need to have those communities to allow people to connect and, to, and if we're going to get in, in touch with students as key stakeholders as key partners in our research we need to have a way of connecting to those students as well so those communities of practice I think are really good if we can keep take a look at what we've done keep doing that and do a bit more in places that don't have it. I think that'd be really beneficial for the sector as a whole as well. Mm, couldn't agree more. Well, Barry, I think this is a really thoughtfully designed study. I think it's it's answered some questions and raised a whole lot more. Uh, I found it fascinating that the students were so savvy about being able to distinguish between group work as a learning experience versus group work as an assessment experience. And I think the light that you've shed on assessment just reminds us that it's assessment that matters most to students, I think, in their university experience, but it's often something that academics just don't pay enough attention to. So I think that um, you've certainly uncovered some very interesting findings that should inform policy and practice, and I think open up a whole new area for further development um, and research. So um, I hope that you'll continue to do work in that area, and uh, thank you very much for everything that you shared with me today. 
Thank you, Marnie. It was great to chat and great to share. And hopefully this is just the start of a conversation with, with others in Ireland and beyond. Um, as you say, this is just um, shining a light on a particular area, but there's other areas that we need to shine a light on as well. So to start of something big, we hope.